Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Richard Robbins here. As always, I hope you're wonderful. Well, I have just interviewed, because I'm recording this after I finish the actual episode, uh, Mr. Tim Hudak, the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. And I was really looking forward to this interview because Tim is a very, very accomplished human being. Um, I'm going to talk about things you might not know about Tim if you followed his political career, but he was born in Fort Erie, right here in Ontario. Uh, he actually got a degree in economics at Western University, and then he got a scholarship and he went on to the University of Washington, where he actually got a master's in economics. Then he was interested in getting into politics, but not as a candidate. And that's what you're going to enjoy about this interview. He'll tell you. And he ended up doing a small stint with Walmart. Yes, as Walmart was coming into Canada. And then he got into politics a couple years after that. But he was an MPP from 1995 to 2016. He was leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservatives from 2009 to 2014. So he spent 21 years in public life. And then he became the CEO of ARIA in September of 2016. And I think you're going to enjoy how he got that job. So there's a lot in this, even if you might have followed Tim Hudak's career when he was in politics, that you have never heard before. And I must say, um, truly a great guy. And it was a real pleasure to have a conversation with Mr. Tim Hudak. So I think you're going to enjoy this. You're going to find out the responsibilities of Korea, of ARIA, of RICO, of the boards, because sometimes it's confusing. You have all these different associations, and I think a lot of people are always wondering, like, you know, what do they all do? Well, he'll take you through that. But also, we're going to talk about the housing shortage, because let's face it, we have a severe housing shortage in Canada. Uh, it needs to be solved. I do believe that at this point, uh, most of the governments, the federal, the provincial, and the municipal governments are working towards that, towards a common cause to fix it, but there is no short-term solution, and Tim might give you some ideas around that as well. So please, enjoy this interview with Mr. Tim Hudak. It's time to build an extraordinary business and a beautiful life with some of the best leaders and minds in the world. Welcome to The Richard Robbins Show with international speaker, best-selling author, and business mentor, Richard Robbins, as he brings his relentless commitment to excellence with in-depth interviews, insights, and experience to help you produce real, outstanding results. Tim Hudak, welcome to the show, my friend. So good to have you here, buddy. Hey, Richard, great to see you. Thanks for having me on the uh, podcast here. I was really excited when you mentioned it to me. And as we begin, I just want to say thank you to you. You were a star on our stage at our reality conference back in uh, March. We wanted you there for your energy, your your expertise to inspire not only the realtors, but fans of real estate in the audience and mission accomplished. I'm happy to report you got like straight A's from the audience. So good <laughs> for you and thanks for being part of it. Well, thank you so much for uh, bringing that up. Uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. I'm I'm really glad that I got to do it. I actually love Ottawa, so traveling to Ottawa was sort of fun for me because I just, I like the city. And of course, I got to meet you for a first time, which was pretty cool. I can't believe <laughs> yeah. that, Tim, we run in the same circles and we've never met because you've been in, you know, CEO of Aria now since 2016, and we've never had the chance to meet. But on the other hand, I also got to see Magic Johnson himself perform at your event, and I must admit, it was a wonderful experience. He did a great job. And you scored three baskets off him backstage, which I think was the highest of any of the other speakers. So yeah, <laughs> you, got, you got some hidden talent there, my friend. Yeah, that was right. um, yeah, magic was uh, incredible at our reality conference. We, you know, obviously we have experts like you that are going to help our our realtor members uh, improve their game and their their service to their clients as realtors. But we also look to other business people, and Magic Johnson, obviously a lot of celebrity, a lot of profile, but. I, 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 he really took us through a lot of emotions there, eh, Richard, from, yeah. from emotional highs and laughter to some, a really touching moment when a young man in the audience said how much Magic Johnson inspires him on the court and in life. And he got all choked up. But to, to hear about his, um, his business success post basketball yeah. and how he's invested in businesses and turned that over and reinvested by using experts for advice. 
Yeah. That was a great story. It really was. And just to bring the audience up to speed, because I think this is something we can all learn from, as he said, when he finished basketball and he wanted to get into business, and he's a you know crazy big business success, right? What he's done. But he went to the owner of the team and he wanted the names of all of the CEOs that have season's tickets. Remember he said that? Absolutely. And, and the goal was he called them up and who's going to say no to Magic Johnson inviting you for lunch or dinner, right? You're a season <laughs> ticket holder, right? And he probably watched this guy for years. And he went out and he interviewed them all about business. And I thought to myself, that it, that's pretty cool, right? Because, you know, let's face it, a lot of guys, they finish basketball, they got a ton of dough, right? And they're going to go into the business world. And they probably think, oh, I'm just going to go into the business world, right? But not Magic. He actually studied business first. He went and interviewed all these, you know, CEOs and, and high-level executives and entrepreneurs. And I, when I heard that story, I thought to myself, that's why he's such a great success, because he's a student, right? And makes such a big difference. That was a pretty cool story. Definitely reinforce the value of expertise, right? Investing in talent uh, around you to to bring up your game. And yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it was neat to hear him talk about how he sees himself as a mentor to so many young athletes who are multimillionaires in their 20s. Yeah. But end up going broke uh, yeah. in their 30s without proper advice. So yeah. if, if uh, folks at home are interested in a future reality conference, by the way, realityconference.ca is, is our website. And it's, you know, we view it as the best stage in Canada to see where real estate is 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 headed. And we're really pleased, Richard, to have you as a big part of that. Well, it was really, it was a lot of fun. I'm really excited to have you here. And here's why I'm, Tim. First of all, when you're in politics, I was a fan, just so you know. Oh, um, I, I noticed I noticed you voted for me. I looked up. Those are those aren't private. I don't know if you knew that, but I saw. No, you I, I, I didn't that. know that. But uh, that wasn't Richard Robbins. That was Dick Robbins that voted for you. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so, so, so we, there's an old joke about, you know, people, people always call me Dick, but anyway, um, but I, I look at it and you're such an accomplished guy and I'm just so looking forward to this interview. I look at it and say, you know, obviously, you know, you're born local Ontario guy, born in Fort Erie. Uh, your, your father, I believe, based on what I read was a principal, your mother was a teacher. So I'm going to say that education was probably pretty important in your family. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My sister ended up being, um, you know, the closest one of the family. She became a high school teacher herself in, in science, was a great athlete as well. So I'm I'm the black sheep in the family. I guess you will get into the politics world. But <laughs> I, I remember, Richard, you know, you you, you probably remember this in the uh, early days where you do a project with handwriting or maybe on your typewriter. And I'd wake up the next morning and the night before my dad would have out his red pen. He'd circle all my mistakes. Then my mom would take out her green pen and she'd circle all the other mistakes. And they <laughs> wake me up early to fix it before I handed the teacher. That, that gets to some of the psychology that's up in here because of that. The red that's and the green great. pen. When I was doing my research, I was thinking, no wonder you, you know, because you, you went to Western, right? Got a degree in economics, and then, and then you got a scholarship. I read this. I'm going, this guy's, this guy's pretty sharp at uh, the University of Washington, and then you go get your master's in economics. Um, so I was then I thought, oh yeah, principal, father, teacher, mom, school's really important. So tell us, you had a very short gig at Walmart. Yeah. Tell us about that. Cause I don't think a lot of people know that about you. Yeah. I um well I thought you said my education was uh, my scholarship was for academics. How'd you know I wasn't like the star football player? You can't see me throwing the line. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but at the conference that we were recently at. Uh, you went out and you opened and you were throwing balls into the audience and you gave yourself away, buddy. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I loved economics as my area of study, just how sort of business and investment work with how people think and how, you know, our, our society will approach issues as well. And where that all comes together, we really like that. And, you know, living in Seattle in the early 1990s was a was a blast as well. I got to be a teacher, kind of like the parents for the undergraduates. It's a great experience. And I, and I thought, Richard, as I was coming out of that, that I would actually get a job in, in politics, not as a politician. I actually <laughs> never envisioned being the one in office. I saw myself as a advisor, a policy research assistant to a prime minister or a minister. That was really my goal. So I came back from Washington and got involved in the Progressive Conservative Party. They were running for re-election. Kim Campbell was then prime minister. And I said, I'm going to go to work. and work my tail off. I'll impress some people. I'll be out there each and every day. And I'll get hired. And I'll work in parliament. And, you know, sort of mission accomplished. 
But, uh, you know, viewers may remember back in 1993, the party got reduced to two seats, <laughs> went from the biggest majority in the history of Canada to having a caucus meeting in a phone booth, for goodness sake. So the job <laughs> opportunities were limited. So what happened at about that same time, this path number one uh, was a closed door. Uh, Walmart was coming to Canada and uh, had uh, a friend whose dad was a manager. We got a management training program and it was really cool, Richard. It was a a chance to be part of a traveling management team as Walmart purchased Wolcos across Canada to go into different communities, basically tear down the old Wolco, rebuild the whole Walmart and the merchandising approach, train the new staff um, and, and train, sorry, train the former staff or now Walmart employees in the culture and then onboard others. And it was usually about a six week process and they need to hop uh, on a bus or a plane and head to the next city. So a really cool way, first of all, to be part of that change, I think fundamentally um, altered the path of retail in Canada. But as somebody in his, you know, mid twenties at that point in time, chance to travel across Canada to live in different communities. It was a great experience. I bet. I bet. Yeah. I, I you know, I, when I read, uh, you know, checking you out on the internet and everything, I, I knew a lot of your history, but I didn't know that one. And then of course uh, you get into politics and you know, it's, that's got to be it. Like, that has to be such a tough game. Like, by the way, like, tell me about your experience in politics. You yeah, know, you well, think about it. You, know, you become the president of the United States, and fifty percent of the people hate you, and fifty percent of the people <laughs> love you. Like, you know what I mean? Most people can't deal with rejection going knocking on a door in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Eh? So, what was and, that uh, experience like for you? With with you know three parties here in the province of Ontario, three main parties. All I needed was forty two percent to get through, so right. I, could, I could at least cut that. Um, so I'll, I'll just finish off. I'll, I'll tell you how I got into the the elected yeah. world, and then we could talk about the the pros and cons and and the roller coaster uh, it was. But uh, retail was uh, I enjoyed it and it was a great experience, but it wasn't where I wanted to be long term. Although I do regret that I didn't keep my Walmart discount card. <laughs> that, that would have added up, and especially with two kids. That would have added up big time over the years. Um, but it was 1995. So fast forward a, a couple of years there and um, there's a provincial election. Mike Harris was leader of the Ontario PCs. Bob Ray was on his way out. He was the premier, the new Democrat. And most people thought the Liberals under Lou McLeod would win, and Harris was just a golf pro from North Bay and was kind of easily dismissed. So I said, here, I'm going to restart my original path. Uh, I'll get involved in the party. I'll get that policy advisor job in, in economics or whatever at uh, Queen's Park, and I believed in Harris. And uh, in my riding in Niagara South, they had never voted PC since before I was born. And a local candidate who was sporting dropped out. He, he just couldn't get off work long enough. He dropped out. And so folks encouraged me to get involved because of my past history in the party. So I said, Richard, what the hell? Yeah. I'll run, I'll lose, but by putting my hand up and stepping forward and taking one for the team, if I do a good job, I'll get noticed, I'll get the job that I want, and I'll be part of a change in the province. So it's one of those things like, watch out what you wish for, <laughs> you might just get it. So I had no inclination I was going to win until about like three or four days left in the campaign. There's a debate. And then the doors I'd knock on, they'd say, I don't know much about you. I was only 27 years old at the time, but I like that Harris guy. I like what he's saying. I don't know if I believe everything, but I like what he's talking about. Put up a lawn sign, I'm going to vote for you. I'm like, holy cats, I'm going to actually win this. Only one other, other guy, Les Vesterfeld, who I think was in his 80s as a volunteer. He'd been knocking on doors since the time of Robert Borden in World War I, I think. <laughs> only he and I are the ones that believed I would win. And then election night, I still remember driving back to my campaign office. I've been out thanking volunteers for working the polls, driving my parents' minivan. I've got my Wendy's double cheeseburger beside me, my root beer, my French fries. Listen to the radio as I head back to the campaign office. And they said, Tim Hudak's got the lead in Niagara South. I almost pulled off the road. I said, what? <laughs> Another bite of the cheeseburger. <laughs> and then they, they, I walk into my campaign headquarters. Luckily, I left the Wendy's behind and all my volunteers were there. The place erupted. There are a few cameras there from like Kojiko and CHCH TV out of Hamilton. And all of a sudden I was elected as an MPP. So there's one of those lessons in life that I always like to talk about to folks to take chances, to be the one who steps forward, to take on the tough jobs. Because even if you don't succeed, you gain respect and experience for trying. I happen to get in that first time. That's amazing. Don't you think, and how do you feel about this or what would you advise people 
I think especially in my space, the people that we coach and work with, and we work with some very, very successful people. Like we, you know, we tend to, you know, work with more of the top producers, if you will, because they sort of a budget for somebody like, you know, my company, right? But I still think that that fear of failure holds a lot of people back. Like they're, they're just so afraid of, you know, whether it's rejection or whether it's embarrassment or, you know, whatever it's, it's, and I think it's, it's a massive, massive break for a lot of people in the world. Um, did it bother you or were you okay with it? Like, how did you feel about it? Because in politics, there's a lot of failure. Well, there's an old expression that uh, almost every career in politics ends in loss, which yes. is really true. Few people walk off the stage as winners all the way through. It's often a loss that you yeah. know ends your career. But I'll, I'll tell you, Richard, 20, 21 years in the business, it was worth it. It was yeah. worth every minute, despite some of the negatives, the positives, just the chance to be you know, one of only 121 people at the time mm -hmm. who had the ability to walk into that chamber, the Legislative Assembly, the Church of Democracy, you had a desk and a microphone, and you were there to advocate for the people who sent you there, what you believe in. You had a voice. It was an incredibly um, honorable position to hold and was tremendously, tremendously uh, motivating. To back to your question, you know, two of the hardest things for people it would be things like knocking on doors mm -hmm. uh, to perfect strangers saying, you want to talk politics? And then secondly, public speaking, both critically important to success. But similarly in real estate, you know, there's a lot of commonality there. Mm -hmm. And I found that that Canadians were actually quite friendly, quite receptive. You'll get the rude one from time to time, but the positivity you get, you also get better at it over time as in anything in life, right? The instant read you'll have, you figure out how to deliver. Um, and I, I actually did enjoy being on a stage. I, I, I steadfast my, my, my ideas. I had strong opinions and uh, willing to, to fight for them, to learn, to listen as well along the way. But I, I always did enjoy that, that clash in front of a crowd mm -hmm. to say who's got the best plan for our province, for our country. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, like you said, like the experience is something that uh, you have with you for life, right? And it changes you for life. And whether we win or whether we lose, or you might say whether we win or whether we learn, we still have the experience. And the experience the ability, is probably what is more valuable. Yeah, um, like in anything, it's exercise. You, you build up muscle, you build up capacity. Yeah. You also build up instincts, right? The ability yeah. to tell by somebody's tone, the language they use, their their body language, how they're feeling about a particular issue and then you can you know make your points in a way that's going to be most receptive to that particular uh, audience i had um an interesting experience on the other side one of my jobs that helped put me through university i worked as border inspector in fort erie so between buffalo and fort erie at the east bridge <laughs> and that was another job in terms of reading people right in a, in a more hostile environment yeah you pick up character traits of folks like if they uh, had nothing to declare they'd often do the interview like this um how long have you been away? 48 hours. Did you go shopping? No. Any alcohol, tobacco? No. All right. They're just looking up the highway, usually with white knuckles on the stairwell. <laughs> that was an easy tell. Yeah. What Maybe a great way to learn to read people. To, I'll write a book someday about how to smuggle through customs. I think I picked up a few. <laughs> so what brought you to an end? Because obviously now... Uh, since you left politics, you're the CEO of uh, Ontario Real Estate Association. What what brought it all to an end for you? I um I'll tell you the story, and I'll, I'll tell you sort of a a, a life lesson I, I took from it, if you like, uh, Richard as well. Twenty one years in business, I won that first election. I talked about ninety five by a squeaker. I had thirty eight percent of the vote. I think I won by twelve hundred votes. But then I, I worked hard. The reputation for delivering, developed a good database, worked that database. And I won five other elections after that, some by like 10 or 12,000 votes. I ran to be, uh, I was successful in becoming leader of the Ontario PC party, uh, ran to be premier. But unfortunately in 2016, more people, sorry, 14 voted for Kathleen Wynne than me. I was close, yeah, but not close enough. And at that point I said, it's time to walk off the stage and let somebody else take over. I won my seat, but not the general election. To back to your point that often careers in politics end in loss, I had a win, but also a loss that day. But it was very much um, mission oriented. I wanted what I loved about politics is every day you're out there fighting for something, mm -hmm. people, ideas. So I wanted something, Richard. My my feet hit the floor every morning. I want to be on a mission that would really 
get my heart beating and was important to Canadians. I had developed over the years a, a very good relationship with the Ontario Real Estate Association. I was very much pro home ownership in my political time, believed in property rights, uh, liked and closely identified with, with realtors. The talent sets are very similar. And I saw that the job was open to be CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. So I threw my hat in the ring. So it linked me was I had some experience in the real estate world on the advocacy side. I was the minister that actually brought forward REBA, the Real Estate Business Brokers Act, through the legislature. And I was really compelled by a mission. And, and what more compelling mission than helping people who help people get a great place to call home? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think home ownership's a very, very important issue that we all need to continue to work on. Um, so let's do this. Let's we'll, we'll start to move a little that direction. But if you look at, and I don't think a lot of people understand all the different associations involved in real estate. So, you know, if we go to Korea, right? You got Korea, you got ARIA. Obviously, that is provincial. Um, but then what we also have is we got RICO, okay? Um, and then we have the boards below that. So generally, what happens is somebody will get a license. What happens through RICO? And then they will join a board. And because they join a board, they become members um, of Korea and Korea. So could you maybe just for the audience that doesn't understand the primary responsibilities of those different associations? Happy, yeah, happy to, Richard. Did you want me to tell you the life lesson when I left politics for real oh, estate? Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. No, no problem. I'll be, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick about this. I'm glad you're actually... keeping me online here. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that other question I'll, I'll get to that's really important about all the different yeah. associations and such. So, you know, something I, I had always believed in too, Richard, was the importance of, of keeping lasting and trusting relationships. You should build those throughout your career yeah. because you never know how things are going to come full circle. That's been part of our success in advocacy because even though I'd sprawl in the legislature with the other parties, it was always respectfully never crossed the line. And we've had a good reception, whether you're liberal, conservative, new Democrat or green. But when I went to interview with Aria, there were, I believe, um, nine people on the panel, uh, all realtor leaders, and seven of them I had met before in various circumstances and had just a click with them that uh, we had great conversations. There was a sincerity so, and, and giving them good service. So I think I had a number of advocates already out of the gate that my competitors for the job didn't have. There was one woman leader who said to me, you know, Tim, uh, you spoke at our conference. And then you didn't do your speech and walk off the stage. You actually went around the room, shook hands with people, looked in the eye, asked about their job, their profession, how was the market. And she said, I was a nobody. I was just sitting in the back corner of the room. But you came and you sat at my table. You talked to me. You didn't look over my head to see who was more important in the room. You actually cared what I said. So then about six years later, you know, that same individual was sitting there on the hiring committee and already was an advocate because yeah. lasting and trusting relationships. Yeah, this is an important lesson I learned as I made that exit and reaffirms, you know, how I try to perform my job. You know, Richard, that's something that you would talk about in your own career success. Yeah, it's, um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's actually a very uh, fundamental teaching that we have as an organization is we've developed something called the lifetime referral system. And our theory is that, you know, you build this database of supporters, right? And you know, if you say, well, if the average person that owns a house <clears throat> knows three to five people are going to buy and sell every year, how do you get those people to tell their friends about you? And that's what you're talking about right here is that, you know, I, my theory is when you go out in there and, and you're going to serve somebody, then you serve them in a way that you're going to blow their mind. Like, I mean, blow their mind. And they want to tell everybody about you and they become an advocate. They become part of your whole sales process. Um, and those relationships, like you said, can be lifetime as long as you continue to bring value to those relationships, right? And there's, you know, many ways of doing that. But that's sort of what I think you're talking about there is something that you did way back when, you know, ended up serving you years later. <clears throat> because you really think about it, we're all, it's no different than me speaking at your event. Listen, whenever I go to an event, I want to understand it. And I'm not saying that it always works out the way I want it to work out every time. And I'm sure it doesn't for you either, but it's not going to be for lack of preparation. It's not going to be for lack of trying. It's not going to be for lack of understanding what the meeting's all about. Why are the people there? Who's in the audience, right? Because I want your support and I want Aria's support. That's how I build a business. 
And if we all look at it that way, it's like this great quote, Martin Luther King, he said, anyone can be great because anyone can serve. And I really? love that quote. But the question I ask myself all the time is, who am I serving? Because I think some people, you know, get caught up maybe in serving themselves rather than, than serving other people with their greater good. So I love that story because it's sort of the, the, the foundation of our teaching as an organization. You know, how can we serve? How can we do a great job for the people and, and turn them into advocates, right? And that's you really what you did and maybe led to you being where you are today, which is pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and thanks for sharing that, uh, Richard, too, about the way you operate, which I would have picked up intuitively from your success and yeah. what you try to imbue in your your clients as well. Um, you had asked earlier about all the different associations. So yeah. uh, remember those... Um, I remember playing with a kid and and you, you may have Richard or your own kids, those little alphabets you put on the fridge, mm -hmm. stick things up with those letters. Yeah. Well, basically you can mix them up and take any three or four and you'll come up with a real estate association of some kind. <laughs> it's probably using a lot of E's and R's and that kind of yeah. thing. Few A's. <laughs> um, so look, there, there are 29 member boards in the province of Ontario uh, and they're under an umbrella of the OREA where I have the honor of serving as CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association and then of the 10 provincial associations and territorial, there's CREA, the Canadian Real Estate Association, on top of that. So picture like that kind of pyramid. CREA is responsible for the brand name of Realtor. They run Realtor.ca. They'll do advocacy at a, a national level on things like mortgage rates, for example, or um, savings account for uh, for home ownership, your RSP. Those would be sort of the areas that CREA does. And they're responsible for educational professional standards across Canada as a whole. The provinces, uh, the Ontario Real Estate Association, you know, are partners in that. A big part of our job that we've already talked about a bit is advocacy, you know, being the voice of the realtor uh, on the street and the men, women, and families that she works for each and every day. A big part of our advocacy is making sure we can help build that next generation of homeowners in the province of Ontario, and also make sure, Richard, we have the highest professional standards anywhere in North America when it comes to, you know, our training, the effectiveness of the regulator, code of ethics. We also provide all the standard forms in Ontario. So if there's a situation you've run into, there's a standard form for that. It's successful because it's a universal language for all real estate exchanges uh, in our province, whether you're in a big city or small town. We also do leadership training. Our realtors are excellent volunteers. I, I would pit any profession against realtors and how they roll up their sleeves and are involved in the grassroots of communities. So we invest in their skills to be uh, a chair of a board, to be the, the treasurer, to be good governors, whether that's a volunteer work like the local hospital board or the soccer association or a real estate association. And our fourth main function there is guidance. Guidance to members on changing uh, laws uh, and how that affects their practice and what it means on the street. Our conferences also play a role there in getting up the best advice like we had you on our stage a couple months ago. And then the other level is the local boards. The local boards represent regionals, uh, regional areas. We're to 29 uh, now. Their biggest function really is around the MLS. They run the MLS system. They're doing that increasingly in groups to share data. They'll invest in realtor education and also enforce the realtor code. If a realtor you know, breaks professional code, the local boards will enforce that. So there is organized real estate in a nutshell. Plus RICO, yeah. forgot about those four letters. <clears throat> They're the regulator. They'll be like the judge and the jury, if you will, if you go offside of provincial legislation. They also run continuing education. So when you take pre-licensing to become a realtor or continuing education, it is the regulator who sets those rules. Right. Now, Aria used to do the education. I don't know how long ago. I think it's like I seven, eight, seven, eight years ago <laughs> that changed, man. I remember very clearly what happened. See? Here's the story. So when I was leaving... Uh, politics, and I uh, was signing the contract for the job at, at, at ARIA. It described what the job would be at the job description. As I said earlier, I knew the advocacy really well. Uh, and also, I was going to run the real estate college. That was all in the bag. Yeah, the contract was up for renewal, but I was assured, Richard, that we always get that contract and we'll get it again. And that was the biggest part of what we did. We were probably, man, 70 employees in the real estate education side, I'd say, ball ballpark. Yeah. Uh, and then just before, you know, I, I came out of the job, Rico ended that contract and awarded it to Humber instead. So before I walked in the door for the first day on the job, 
they had moved it over to Humber. So there was a transition. And that was a management challenge because I had to downsize my operation, right? We had to phase out. I mean, a lot of people sadly had to, to lose their jobs. Some had been there for quite a strong amount of time. They believed in education and helping the students succeed uh, as Humber picked up the program. So we fully phased out during COVID. I think it was 2021 okay. uh, or 22 and the last student passed through our doors. Now they all go through Humber. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And you did yeah. a great job talking about the organization because I know a lot of people are very confused by it all and the responsibilities of the associations and RICO. Now, it's funny because we're, I shouldn't say it's funny because it's not actually funny, but we're faced with a real housing challenge right now uh, in the country, definitely in Ontario, but but in the country. And uh, Doug Ford, you know, he came out with his housing affordability task force with, I think he had, what, 55 points, I believe, if I'm not mistaken on that. Right. Um, and ARIA responded to that. I think it's in February when ARIA responded to that, where they they sort of released reports sort of analyzing, you know, what was happening here in Ontario. And we talked about home ownership and home ownership, I think, is such an important thing, you know, for for people, especially in Canada. Right. It's, it's really important in Canada. Um, maybe there's some places in Europe, not as much, but in Canada, it's really a big deal. Um, so could you maybe comment on that? What do we need to do? Because depending on what you read, you know, how many houses were short, like the numbers range between two million and three and a half million, depending what it is you're going to read. Um, but there's no question that we have a shortage. And I will say I've been in real estate 40 years. I have seen interest rates go up a number of times. I have worked in real estate in very difficult markets. And this is the only time I've ever seen this take place is that rates go up because let's face it, 2020, 2021, sort of crazy years, right? Insane years during COVID. Market starts to slow down sort of the latter part of 2022 a little bit. Um, and then it sort of, you know, we drift through last year. Year was okay, but sales volume was down overall. So we had our sales volume drop. And every time sales volume has dropped in the past because of interest rate going up, inventory went up and people started to compete to sell and we moved into buyer market territory. This market, that has not happened. What has happened is sales have dropped. Inventory has risen, but marginally, not, not near as much. Like we're still sitting instead of say 0 0.7, 0 0.8 months of inventory and say Toronto is an example, we're now maybe two and a half, 2.8 a month of inventory, which is still, even though it's a weak seller's market, it's still a seller's market and we're doing multiple offers. And the cause of that is a shortage of houses, period, right? So what, what do you see that we need to do to get control of this so that there will be houses affordable for people? Because we have so many immigrants coming in, right? And we need a place yeah. for all these, these people to live. Yeah, it w we could probably spend the rest of the broadcast talking about uh, all of these all of these things. And, and Richard, you put it quite well. I will remark, you said 40 years in real estate. So you started with, what, you're 10? <laughs> yeah, and after right. finishing the paper <laughs> route, you went out and sold houses, yeah. right? No, I was a young, naive, 24-year-old living in Peterborough, Ontario. That's where I started. Peterborough. Wow. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. Well, congrats cool. on, on your success. It's interesting to hear about your perspective over four decades They've never seen this phenomenon before, but but you nailed it. And Housing Affordability Task Force yeah. pointed this out that we just had a dramatic lack of housing supply for for two decades. Richard, we were building far far fewer homes than we needed for mm -hmm. population growth. For the fact that millennials were coming of age, getting promoted, having families looking for a home, uh, and the immigration, so we were far behind. So number one job when you're in a hole, you stop digging, yeah, and you try to climb your way out. I want to reinforce too what you said about the value of home ownership in, in, in Canadian culture. I remember when Debbie and I bought our first home uh, in 2002, it, it changed me as a man. I, I care more about my property. I reinvested back into it. I was comfortable this would be a good investment for me over my lifetime and for my family. I cared more about my neighbors. Debbie and I got more involved in the community as volunteers. You know, coming from the economics background, there's an old line that you can lay all the economists head to toe, Richard. And they'll never reach a conclusion. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to home ownership, it's pretty clear. 
it just it's straight it's the it's the fabric of the middle class it builds strong communities good neighborhoods that's why we need to invest in home ownership it changes us as people and it changes and makes society even stronger so what do you do about it well um i had the honor of being part of that housing affordability task force so i had a, a front row ringside seat as part of that knew the report quite well and knew we had accomplished the government had accomplished a number of good things but there's still some stuff left on the table mm -hmm. to their credit the Ford government has implemented um, either fully or partially 76 percent of those recommendations <laughs> having come from government that's a pretty good track record yeah. off of these reports just sit up on a shelf and gather dust right so pretty good that's a very good start but there's some important things left on the table largely around uh, getting approvals uh, done faster intensifying in in urban areas like around uh, transit around subway stations and making sure those upfront costs are not borne by the first time home buyer Water and waste water, for example, Richard, there's a better way to finance those than putting on development charges. If you were to find a better way to finance them, like Aria has recommended, that would probably take 50 to 60K off the price tag of a home for first time buyers or move up buyers. Yeah, there's, there's just so many things that need to be done. I think we're going the right direction now, like at least sort of all three governments are on it, if you want to say that, right? You know, the federal government's on it, provincial government, municipalities are all on it as well and working together towards that. But it's interesting. I I know a number. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. My my best friend lives in Calgary, Alberta, and he's a builder. My son actually works for him. Um, and what well, he's actually, <clears throat> my son actually had now his ownership and uh, sort of the second in charge. Um, and he used to build at one time you know, 70 homes downtown Calgary. Now, these were infills, and these were expensive homes, okay? They're, you know, Elbow Park area, that sort of thing. And about three years ago, he stopped. He said, Rich, I can't make any money anymore. And wow. as we know, the Calgary market's still doing okay, right? It's probably the strongest market in Canada right now by far. Um, but he just finally said, he said, the approvals are taking me too long. He said the cost of the development of that land is way too high now. And he said, at the end of the day, you know, I'm building these homes on spec. And then, you know, he said, sometimes I'm getting $80,000 out of a project that took me two years. And he goes, that just doesn't make any sense, right? So uh, he's an example of, I'm sure, many, many other developers and builders that just look at it and say, you know, it's just not worth taking the chance anymore. So I think that's a big problem. The second problem I see right now, and I'd love to know your comments on this, since the rates have gone up, a lot of developers have put you know, their developments on hold. They've pulled projects off and go, listen, we're not doing it right now because I've got to borrow a whole bunch of money for this development and I can't afford to pay the new rates and you know that sort of thing. Um, so how do you see you know, that? How do, how do we overcome that? How do we get th these people out back developing properties? Like I like the idea of, yeah, you can put a coach house in your backyard now. And I think a lot of those ideas are all good. Um, but what about getting these developers out there? Because the amount of time it takes to, to pass something and then the amount of costs have become, you know, pretty outrageous for a lot of them. You make an excellent point, um, Richard. In, on the Housing Affordability Task Force, we saw that that demonstrated, you know, by way of example, some of those those fees and permitting costs and all that mean that the home builder has to put up about one hundred and forty or one hundred fifty thousand dollars right. before the first shovel goes into the ground. And who ultimately pays that? It's the buyer trying to go to the marketplace. We need to find a way to get those costs down and speed up the approvals process. Here's here's the good news. I had mentioned the recommendations we made. The Ford, we lobby constantly on this issue. I was you saw the premier earlier today, and they they have actually moved. The ball down the field because 2021 we had the most homes built since the 1980s okay now we're in quite a hole that's not going to make up for it but at least as you said we're heading in the right direction 2022 was the next best year in those two decades more most homes built and also when it came to purpose-built rentals 23 it fell off as a result of the higher interest rates you just mentioned so what can you do there well i think that interest rates been too high for too long and certainly people watching this have, are feeling that and working hard for their, their clients. They made a deal with us, Richard. The Bank of Canada basically said, if we get inflation down 3% or lower, we're going to ease off the interest rates. 
They've broken that promise. It has become a stranglehold on the dreams of so many to own a home or builders to actually get the financing to, to build the home. When you take out the costs of mortgages and rents out of the inflation measure, it's down around 2% or, or lower. Mission accomplished. Let's lower interest rates so people can actually get into the market or move up and leave that first uh, starter home for a first-time buyer. A big concern I have, and, and you mentioned you know, the federal government, the province, municipality now have the same songbook and are moving in the right direction when it comes to getting homes built. But the federal agencies like the Bank of Canada with its interest rate policy, the superintendent who watches over the banks has made loans more restrictive so developers can't get the funds to get projects off the ground. The Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which had traditionally played a role in helping build home ownership, is rudderless with no CEO and, and no chair. Mm -hmm. And then when they did act on the 30-year amortizations, which Ari has called for for some time, Richard, it was limited to first-time home buyers only um, for homes <laughs> under a million dollars only and only new homes. Mm -hmm. What is that, like 1% of the market? So what do we need to answer your question? Stay on the track when it comes to getting more homes built, but we all see those federal agencies to get on inside the polit political leaders and row in the same direction instead of across purposes right now that's causing us to tread water at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good points. And I do agree, rates, we need to get the rates. They got to start to lower the rates as well. And, you know, the, the, the problem we're dealing with here is not, a, there's no short-term solution. Like it took us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long time to get out of this. We're not fixing this next year or anything like that. But, you know, hopefully that uh, we can all come together and we can all start moving the right direction. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Get ready. You've got another few minutes to go, Tim. I want to loosen this up. I want to have a little bit of fun. And sure. uh, so I've got some lightning rounds. So you want questions. me to leave and get so many more fun in here then? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I got some uh, I got some lightning round questions and I'm going to finish up with what I call the big three. Uh, so lightning round is just uh, stupid questions that have no meaning and you can't win a prize for them. Favorite food? Oh, chicken wings. Love chicken wings. I grew up across oh. from Buffalo. If I don't have chicken wings at least every two weeks, I go yeah. into remission. I like that. Favorite movie? Two. Can I give you two? Sure. I love two. Good, yeah. the bad, the ugly. Love those Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns and yeah. Field of Dreams because I know it's schlocky, but I love the baseball. I love the father son relationship yeah. and, and the spirit of that movie. Those are my top two. Good stuff. Uh, what book should everyone read? You know, a, a book that actually guided me well. Uh, I read when I was, uh, before I got in politics, was called The Book of Virtues. It's by a guy named William Bennett. He was a uh, a member of uh, the Bush administration and the Reagan administration. And really, it's a collection of, of short stories and fables that reinforce, you know, those those values that have made our society strong, I think, are values for success and hard work, discipline, giving, true friend, loyalty. It just reinforces those values and shows how kids' stories through adulthood, yeah. the more we can rely on those, but I'll have to say is, that, you know, the old school values, yeah. the more successful we're going to be. Yeah, I like that. I wrote that down. You have to read that. Favorite hobby? Love riding my motor, my um, my mountain bike. I was gonna say motorbike. There, I'm scared of motorbikes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, if you know, sometimes when I was making big decisions in in the world of politics or today, uh, I got two beautiful girls, sixteen and ten. Love love spending time with my wife, my wife Debbie. But honest to goodness, Richard, I want to make a big call. It's just nice to be isolated, nothing around you, and. The notion of my mountain bike out in a trail somewhere, busting through some bushes or across a long field, spotting a deer or a wild turkey, scaring the hell out of them. Yeah. Love those kind of moments. Come home all dirty and mucky and exhausted, but full of energy and usually can make a call as a result of that. Very good. Very good. Uh, favorite music or musician? I now would say, you yes, you know, yes, Tim Hudak, we talked about earlier, would have been uh, Morrissey and the Smiths. I, I I never saw the Smiths or my favorite band through high school. I'm a, a child of the 80s era, still play the music all the time. Today, Kid Rock. I do like my Southern fried rock. I, I like that sort of rock country mixture, and it's just a lot yeah. of fun. You know something? He's very good. Actually, I'm very excited. I'm going to New York City tomorrow to see Elton John. Or not Elton John, uh, Billy Joel. That will be amazing. It's like the stuff that I, I would love to see him in New York. My wife would kill for that because she loves New York City. Yeah. We actually saw him in in uh, Toronto a little while ago. And my God, he was uh, just such a great performer. And you just can't help but sing along, right? 
I know. I'm I'm so looking forward to it. A few days with my wife and uh, Billy Joel. Um, favorite day of the week? Thursday. Why? Because it's kind of like almost the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of transitioning. Thursday night used to be a new wave night of the aqueduct, so that was always in my mind. It was a good night to go out for wings and beers. There can be some, uh, certainly not Monday through Wednesday. Friday and Saturday is organized plans i just like the way that thursday feels yeah i get it i get it okay so let's do this small giant so this is sort of the the last couple of questions small giant so we actually when i have a lot of presenters present whether they're to our top coaching clients at our events whatever the case is uh, we get them to present a small giant and what a small giant is it's a it's a small idea that's easily actionable that's not terribly hard to do but if somebody would just do it with absolute consistency it would produce an extraordinary result in their business or life does anything come to mind that you could share i i think that um the more rare i go back to the old school the old school is the more powerful it is yeah. you know one thing that i did through my current politics and i've done it here i should get back to doing it more is the power of the handwritten note yeah. There was a guy named uh, Andy Brandt. He was the leader of the PC party. Andy is famous because Richard, believe it or not, he was the chair of the LCBO under three different governments. It's a big plum appointment. And Andy taught me when I got my start in politics, the power of the handwritten note. It gets me a little choked up. I would, I would go around to houses and I'd see notes that I had written, you know, maybe their daughter won the speaking contest. They had uh, triplets. Uh, they had um, been valedictorian. Yeah. People would actually have them framed on their walls. I remember going to see the girl of the year uh, at a Grimsby Chamber of Commerce event. She was a high school graduate going to university, and she had, uh, I see, I get choked up, some of her memorabilia over the years. And I said, man, that looks familiar. It was a handwritten note I had sent to her for, you know, winning a, I think, gymnastics con um, contest when she was eight or nine years old. She had it framed as one of the memories for her life. Power of the handwritten note. Amazing. I love that, Tim. I love it. Um, next question is, based on what you know now, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? It actually worked out all right. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, if I could go back in, uh, in, in, in time, I would actually say, number one, one thing I did learn, invest in real estate. If I had done that, you know, in the earlier days, I'd be in a much better spot. Now I'm still pretty good. I got a home at, in my early 30s when many people are struggling today. But man, I, if I go back to the 20s, I would talk about the power of investing uh, like that. And maybe a few uh, fewer nights with the beers and the chicken wings uh, in consequence. Other advice I'd give, because, you know, I, we walked through it and and uh, to get elected at 27 was was pretty cool. And I wouldn't want to tell young Tim not to do that because it was a rewarding life. I wish I traveled a bit more. Uh, when I see young people today, I have nephews uh, and their fiancés, um, Richard, who are now working in Europe, and they have the ability to do so remotely. And the chance in your 20s to, to go from country to country and learn other cultures and people and how much you must grow as part of the experience. So if I'd say to young Tim, I did live in Seattle for a couple of years, but maybe cross an ocean or two. Yeah, yeah great advice. So my last... Uh... Last is my tagline. It's a beautiful life. Make it count. What's a beautiful life to you? Hmm. If I, um, so I think of my kids there, right? And uh, I'd, I'd want Miller and Maitland to be happy, fulfilled individuals, a, a, a good group of friends, comfortable in their their own skin, uh, have the ability to, to do what they want, but to be, be, be true to themselves. Right. And they're young. I have no idea what path uh, they're on. Um, you know, I, I, my parents, I was raised in a very, very supportive, encouraging uh, household. Uh, my parents were uh, great parents. So if I can be half the parent my, uh, my mom and dad uh, have been and help my girls develop those, those values and the comfort of just being themselves, I think that's the most beautiful life I can ask for for my daughters. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more, more my friend. That's uh, that was that was very well said. So, so listen, I want to thank you. It's so good to have you here. Uh, I'm glad we got a chance to meet in Ottawa. I'm glad we got a chance to do this podcast. And 
and I hope we get some more time together in the future, maybe over some wings and beers. Who knows? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I look forward to that. Well, what's your, yeah. so you Billy Joel, right? We'll have some Billy Joel playing in the background, a little bit of Kid Rock. We'll get that set up, Richard. And listen, say thank you. Thank you for having me on, but more importantly, thank you for what you do to raise the bar when it comes to uh, realtors uh, across uh, North America, what that means for uh, their clients at home, the families they're helping out, uh, and you you killed it on our stage. So thank you for what you're doing on one of the most important things in, in Canadian culture, and that's getting a great place to call home. Well, it's a it's a real honor to me. I think because I've been in real estate so long, Tim, that I have a very soft spot my soft spot in my heart for realtors, right? I just I know what they deal with every day and I know how difficult it is for many of them. Work nights and weekends and you know, that sort of thing. Cause I went through it. I remember it. And uh and yeah, you know, the helping people with their most, generally speaking, their most valuable asset, that's a big responsibility. It is an, it is an awesome thing when I ever ask a realtor to tell me the story about the first time they helped a young young couple get a place to call home. And you get the smile on their face and the spark on their eyes, like how much meaning, despite the ups and downs, the challenges of the marketplace, the, the meaning you get from your profession, that's all worth it. I agree. Well, thank you for being here, my friend. It was uh, it was a real honor to have you. Uh, pleasure's mine, Richard. We'll see you out and about. Thanks for being on. Keep up the great work. Right. Okay, great stuff. Just a little spot there we can break. Tim, that was great. Thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate you. Yeah, taking my pleasure. Time. Yeah. No, thank you for doing the research that you obviously did, and it's fun to do those uh, those rapid fires as well. Yeah, it's just a little fun, right? I try to keep a little lighthearted, but try to get some good content in there somewhere. So it's um, great mix. It was great. But thanks again. And uh, hopefully we will uh, we will see you soon, Tim. All the best. I look forward to it. Join us at richardrobbins.com for more in-depth insight and training to build your business and your beautiful life. And remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single beautiful episode.